Happy Sabbath, church. Thank you, Rachel, for that beautiful piece. Uh, I want to welcome all of you all to church this, this morning, the this Sabbath morning. I want to, of course, welcome all of those who are watching and uh, worshiping with us online this morning or whenever uh, you are watching the stream. We're so thankful that you've chosen Kettering as your space to worship. And, and of course, we're so thankful that all those in, uh, in the, the sanctuary this morning um, chose to be with us. And we pray that this service will have a provide a connection between you and God. We have a couple of announcements I want to go through this morning. First and foremost, if you received the email, um, there was a small typo because the Aeolians will not be in concert this afternoon. They will be in concert next week. And so uh, next week at 9 o'clock at 4 p.m., uh, please uh, come out and worship with us with the Aeolians. They'll also be with us for church service. So you're going to want to be prepared to spend the entire day uh, with us as the Aeolians will be uh, worshiping with us both in service and in concert at 4 p.m. On that same day, another very full day, uh, we'll have our church gym night um, at 7 p.m. at Spring Valley Academy. So uh, be prepared to come out and play some games and just have fun kind of in somewhat of an old-fashioned Sabbath day. From the very beginning to the very end, we'll be worshiping and having fun together. On March 16th at 1 p.m. in the upper room, we will have our spiritual gifts seminar. Together, we will uncover the unique gifts God has given to each of us. So please bring a sack lunch. That is March 16th at 1 p.m. in the upper room. And then on the same day, on March 16th in the upper room, we are going to have an open mic night. Uh, and uh, this is something we've been talking about for some time and excited to be able to, uh, to, to have fun together in a different way where you can share some, uh, some of your unique talents, if it's music, if it's stand-up comedy, if it's storytelling, um, poetry, uh, we would love for you to do so. But please sign up by using the, um, uh, the QR code and the link so we can uh, prepare and make sure we have everything prepared for you. So that is March 16th at 8 p.m. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then on April 12th to the 14th, there will be a men's retreat at Woodland Lakes Christian Camp. Uh, so we also invite uh, all of the men who are interested to sign up via the QR code and uh, so forth. And, of course, you can find all of this information in your K-Life email. And then finally, I want to remind everyone that uh, there will be prayer meeting that's that we have, we're having a prayer meeting every Wednesday at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall, and all are welcome for that. Um, today, uh, we, have a, a, we have also a couple of uh, business, some business that we need to take care of, uh, that we have some transfer, new members, uh, some transfers in and out. And so I'm going to just take a second, if you can read the names of the transfers in. And... This is the list of names for the transferred out. And since this is the second reading, I think we have to do the official vote. So I will continue moving forward to ask if there is uh, uh, someone will move that we will uh, approve both the transfer in and out. So moved and second. All in favor say aye. All right. And it is officially carried. Um, I'm going to do something also a little different, John. I'm going to call on you in a second. You are unprepared for this, so it's okay. Don't worry. It's not going to be too hard. But before I bring you up, I'm going to ask that Daryl and Melissa Blahovich would come uh, come to the front now. We, uh, as obviously we've we've just voted some members in and out, but we also uh, have some some individuals who have been very close to this community and making um, our services run smoothly who will be leaving us. Uh, Daryl has uh, accepted a call uh, to Mount Eagle and Cumberland Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's about an hour west of Chattanooga, and I believe that this is uh, his uh, last Sabbath with, with us. And uh, they have dedicated their time in so many, uh, so many levels, both with music, with um, audio and live stream. And so if you've ever had experienced worship on any level here in the sanctuary, then you have been blessed by their contribution. So let's give them a warm round of applause, showing our love for them as they prepare to leave. Before you go, we just want to have a, just a brief word of prayer. I'm going to hand handheld one over to him. So, okay, he has handheld three. So this is unplanned. So he's going to say a word of prayer. Father God, when family um, leaves, it makes us look forward to what is to come. It makes us look forward to, to look forward to heaven, and when there's a time when there's no more sadness, when there's no more goodbyes, 
And Father, we look forward to uh, the celebration that comes. Father, we thank you for Daryl. We thank you for um, the, the passion of ministry that you've given to him. I want to ask Jesus that you bless him in a powerful, powerful way as he ministers in, in Tennessee. I want to ask, Father, that you, just, um, that you just bless him with your Holy Spirit. I want to ask, Father, that you pour your countenance upon him to give him wisdom, to give him grace, to give him peace. Father, we thank you so much for Marissa. Uh, she's done so much here in our church, whether it be leading uh, children's ministry, being involved with the choir, uh, just so much that, that, that she has been involved with. And Father, we thank you so much for her gifts in ministry as, um, as she has just played such an important and critical role here in our life. I want to ask, Father, for um, a blessing to be upon them in their marriage as, as they move forward with this next step of faith. I want to ask, Father, that you continue to just um, draw them closer to you as they draw closer together with one another. And like we said earlier, Jesus, we can't wait until the time when we get to be reunited in heaven forever and ever and ever, and that there's no distance that ever has to separate us again. We love you, Jesus. Praise your name. Amen. So we'll continue um, with our icebreaker. So I was supposed to give a talk at Spring Valley Academy uh, yesterday for their chapel, but they came to the better senses and changed their schedule. Uh, so that means you all are going to get the talk that I have for them ready, okay? No, really, but, but, uh, not, but I did put some slides together. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, the, uh, the idea of this topic was going to be about um, Galatians 6.9. Oh, and it's where it says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap harvest if we do not give up. And I thought about some things in our lives that we do over and over, and sometimes when you do things over and over, they tend to lose meaning because it just becomes habit. And we can sometimes forget that meaning. And I thought of the th idea of a cliche. I have some slides, and we're going to use this kind of as our icebreaker. A cliche, of course, is a phrase or opinion that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought. So I'm going to put some cliches up, and I want you all to finish or fill in the blank of these cliches. Never judge a book by its cover. All right, very easy. So next one. Okay, that's the answer. And the lesson, of course, of never judge a book by its cover is, next slide, is, is that you should not judge someone based on how they look rather than what is on inside of them. Okay, let's do the next cliche. Sorry for the line, but every cloud has a Silver lining, of course, and the, the idea, the next slide behind that is even, a, even bad situations can often provide something positive. These are all powerful lessons, and you know, cliches, we, we say them and sometimes they lose meaning, but they have some powerful lessons if we remember them. Let's go to the next one. Think long, think, someone said right? Hard, no, think long, think Wrong. Oh, I got you all. Think long. Some people didn't know that one. Think long, think wrong, which often means indecision can sometimes lead to making the wrong decision. Okay, let's do one more. Oh, let's do the next one. I'm sorry. Let's skip, because this one is easy. Read between the lines. Yeah, that's, that's, let's, let's go, keep on going. One more. What you blank is what you blank. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. That's the idea behind that. It's, it, the lesson is uh, someone, showing you, someone is showing you their real self, and they're not hiding anything. So just briefly for this icebreaker, hopefully this kind of made you think about some of your favorite cliches. Share with your neighbor one of your favorite cliches and the lesson that that cliche is, uh, is referencing. So just take a second to share a favorite cliche with your neighbor. A lot of cliches just swirling around here, I hear. Someone said they hadn't heard think long, think wrong, which is good. I was trying to find a cliche that, uh, that maybe was somewhat unfamiliar. So uh, hope you all enjoyed that. Let's, let's pause for a word of prayer before we continue in worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for life, health, and strength and for waking us up this morning. Lord, let's not take for granted the simple things in life, the fact that you've given your life for us, and we have the opportunity to come and worship collectively. Lord, sometimes we do things so frequently that we forget the, the joy, the, uh, the gifts 
of love that is provided for us, Lord. So remind us that today, and as we, we consider our spiritual gifts, Lord, uh, in, this, in this sermon, in this new sermon series, maybe we, we refreshed anew, reminded anew of all that you have done for us. Be with us in this service, we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we sing our opening hymn. Would you stand with me as we sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name? may be seated, and we want to now invite our children forward for this morning's Kids Life. As you come forward, please collect the offering for Spring Valley Academy and the Worthy Student Fund. All right, good morning and happy Sabbath, boys and girls. How are you? Everyone's doing all right? Well, I got a question for you. You guys ever heard of the game, Would You Rather? Yeah, yeah that's a great game. Would you, you're shaking your head like maybe you don't like the game. 
I don't know. You've not heard of it? So would you rather have this gift or would you rather have this gift? This one? Ah, okay. Why is it that you would like to have this gift and not this gift? It's a bigger gift. That's what I would have said when I was your age. It's a bigger gift. What about you guys? Would you rather have this one or this one? Ooh, the tiny one. Well, we're kind of split down the middle. This is great. This is good. Yeah, you really want that big one. What would it, would it change things if you knew what was inside? Yeah. So maybe the type of gift might say, like, if this was just full of, I don't know, uh, balloons, and this one was full of diamonds, there we go, which one would you rather have? Yeah, probably the smaller one, yeah. Smart thinking, kids. You guys are on the ball. All right. So, today the sermon that we're going to be hearing is talking about gifts, And it's a different type of gift. So I'm going to ask you some would you rather questions, but it's going to be kind of along the lines of what the sermon's going to be about. Would you rather, would you rather stand at the front door of the church and say, welcome, good morning, happy Sabbath to all the people that come in, or would you rather go and visit someone at home who's not feeling well? Visit someone at home who's not feeling well? Anyone think that they would want to welcome people into the church? Welcome people into the church. Would you rather preach the sermon, get up in front, and tell everyone about Jesus? Or would you rather go and spend time with someone who's sick and help them feel better? Sermon. Sermon. So we've got some young aspiring preachers. What about you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, since your dad's not feeling well, you'd rather go home and help him feel better. Mm. See, here in our church, we want to live and love like Jesus. That's our goal. That's what, that's what we're all coming together to do. And Jesus has given us these things called spiritual gifts, which is just a A way of saying God gives each of us the ability to do different things. For some people, it's being able to talk in one language, and people can understand you in their own language, even though you guys don't speak the same language. For some people, God might give them the gift that they can actually pray for someone, and they're sick, and they get better, just like that. Because God, Jesus, wants us to be able to show his love to the people around us So he gives us different gifts. And when I asked you, would you rather do one kind of thing at church or another? God gives you gifts and the ability so that you can do those things here at church. And one's not better than the other because they're all important. Because Jesus wants to use each one of us to show other people how much he loves them. Thank you for your good attention. You can go back to your seats.
Thank you so much, Church Choir. Thank you so much, Pastor Jeremy, for leading us. As you guys know, we've mentioned it and during the announcements and everything, today we're starting a new uh, sermon series talking about spiritual gifts and the passions and the gifts that God has given to us. How do we then use those and pour those out so that others can be blessed by them? And um, as, as you also have noticed, over the past several weeks, we've been taking this moment to be able to highlight stories that, that happen within our everyday church. Um, these stories, they often fall by the wayside because they're not always noticed, and we want to give intentionality to bringing them so that, so that they can not only be a blessing to one another, but maybe even challenge us in how we live in our day-to-day, in our life, in our everyday life. Um, today, we have Todd Christie, who, Todd, I think you and I basically grew up together. You're a little bit older than me, but I remember when you were a PA student next door at Kettering College, and then I remember graduation and everything like that for you. So Todd's been a part of our church family here for a very long time, I would say, if that's safe to say. Um, And Todd, I have a couple questions that I want to ask for you. Today, we're specifically going to talk a little bit about prayer and and your own spirituality. And um, how has prayer changed you? Like, what was this moment for you? I think the moment that uh, prayer changed in my life was back in 1996. I was at the high school. I was a junior at Spring Valley Academy Uh, Hazel Burns and others in the community um, organized a prayer conference at the high school, and um, one of the activities on Sabbath uh, was to divide into groups. My group uh, had the assignment of going to the mall and praying with random strangers, uh, which was a little discouraging after an hour and a half hadn't really engaged in any meaningful prayer. Uh, Most people just wanted to get in and get out and weren't very interested, but toward the end of that time, I looked up into the upper level of the mall, and there was a lady sitting on a bench, Um, so I went up and offered to pray for her. She immediately started crying and told me that she had come to the mall to end her life, to figure out a way to end her life, and when I offered to pray with her, uh, she said, there truly must be a God to send someone to pray with me at a desperate time like this. And I realized at that moment that prayer is not just something that we do before meals, but it's it's literally life-saving. So um, then fast forward to uh, PA school in 2001, um, I spent a month uh, surgery rotation with David Small uh, in general surgery, and he prayed with every patient before surgery. And I saw the same thing. I saw tears and I saw this raw emotion as patients are in this fearful state right before surgery and worrying about the outcome and and the way that that changed people. And and now we have research that patients that are prayed for before surgery have lower mortality rate and lower risk of infection. They do better, they live better when they're prayed for. So uh, I've taken that into my practice. Dr. Schwartz, who I work with, Brian Schwartz in cardiology, Uh, offers a prayer with every patient that he sees. And um, so we have an opportunity 20 times, 25 times every day to offer prayer and and see that changing lives. So the powerful experiences there have changed my prayer life. In in what ways have those changed your prayer life? Um, So at the beginning of the day, uh, we pray in the office, and that's meaningful to offer prayer with uh, my colleagues and uh, lift up each other in prayer, and um, lift up our patients in prayer. So it's it's become real, real meaningful. Me, uh, meaningful. It, it's nice to be able, I think, to be in a in a work environment that celebrates um, spirituality in in what you do every single day. And I think how you said there's something powerful about being able to pray with a patient beforehand, whether it be a major surgery, something minor, even just a day to day visit, that kind of thing. What is a hope that you have for our church specifically here? I would hope that anyone that came to our church would have someone that they connect with um, that they could go to and ask uh, for prayer. Um, So that my hope would be that we would be such uh, a warm and welcoming church that we could connect with at least one person um, while they're here and and reach out to them throughout the week to ask them how they're doing and what, what we can pray for. Thanks so much, Todd. As you guys can note just from a little bit of that story there, um, there's a spiritual gift that's been given to Todd in a very, very special way. And that spiritual gift, he has been able to harness that and to channel that so that every single day that he works and as he serves as a PA, 
um, he's able to bless others not only by the gift of healing, but also by the gift of prayer and the gift of spirituality. So, Todd, thank you so much for your ministry. I know um, you do a lot, not only for our church here physically, but also thank you so much for what you do in expanding the kingdom of God. Thank you. We're going to enter into our season now of, of offering and, and pouring out our thanks to God for what he does uh, on a day-to-day basis for us. We want to thank you so much for supporting what happens here locally at the church and also what happens across the denominationally through tithe and those metrics there as well too. Um, in this moment here, we would just love for you to uh, continue to, to harness what, what God is doing in your heart and in your life. And um, as you give, may you give uh, because, of, because of what the gospel does central to your heart today. I would invite with you to kneel with me in prayer. Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you in prayer today. Uh, what a blessing we have uh, to come together as a church and, and, and hear music and uh, be touched by uh, others uh, who have uh, affected the, the footprint of our lives and I just pray that each one here today would feel uh, your power uh, and your peace, uh, that they would feel the level of, of others reaching out to them. Uh, as I look to so many friends here in the church, uh, I pray that uh, others who are newer here in the church would find the same uh, love and friendship that I have uh, found here too. So thank you for uh, a church where we can learn to grow more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture will be taken from Ephesians 4.16. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's great to see you. I wasn't here last week because I was at Southern, which was a great trip. I went with the youth, but, oh, thank you. But it's always great to be home. I'm going to invite you to do something first before I start. I want you to go to somebody, hopefully it's somebody you don't know, preferably, and you're going to share with them what your talent is, one of your talents, and what your spiritual gift is. Okay, got it? A talent and a spiritual gift. All right, go.
Okay, hopefully you got to share with somebody else. There might be someone who said, well, I'm not sure what my spiritual gift is. If that was you, that's okay, and you're, you're in the right place because that's why we're doing this series. So that at the end, we'll have a seminar. It's going to be me this week, next week, Pastor Christian, and then Pastor John the third week. And on that afternoon, we'll have a spiritual gifts seminar so that you can discover what your spiritual gifts are. And it's a really great program because it matches your passion and your spiritual gifts so that you can start using them. And then the whole point is that you start using them here at church. We plug you into some ministries. We started the series, the year, with vision, mission, and purpose statement. Our vision, I'm going to keep repeating this because we need to know who we are. A vision, our vision is a church where Jesus changes lives. That's what I want to see. Our mission is to make disciples for Jesus by preaching the three angels' message, by letting people know that Christ is victorious. And our purpose, which really you could say is our motto as a church, it is to live and love like Jesus and encompasses all of that. Well, as a disciple of Jesus, if I'm committed to living and loving like Jesus, then I sign up for certain things. I can't say I love people, but I only love this, this group of people and not these guys. I also can't say I'm going to keep Jesus for myself because then I am neglecting the mission. And I also cannot say, okay, well, the Holy Spirit is working in my life, but I'm not going to use my spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Disciples of Jesus have and use their spiritual gifts. We may not always know what those gifts are. That is true. It takes time and use. When I was in college, I did a spiritual gift seminar. I was part of one and at the end they gave you what your results are for spiritual gifts and my top two number one was teaching which makes perfect sense that is what I was guessing was going to come up but number two was hospitality and I thought it was wrong that somebody had made a mistake <clears throat> because as I've told you before I can't cook if you come to my house you're gonna get one of two things soup that I know how to make or haystacks that's it, those are your two options. And then I will also not really have the table set up properly, there will be something missing, you will have to tell me you need this or that. But over time I came to realize I do have this gift. Just because it's not the way I imagine this gift is to look like, I do have it. Because I love spending time with people. I love having people at my house. And the more the merrier, where my husband is like pulling his hair out, whereas I am saying, please come, more of you the better. I love this. And we just figure it out. There's not enough food, oh, that's okay. God will bless it, right? That's, that's my attitude because I love hanging out with people. Maybe it started because at my house, growing up, that's what we did. There's five of us kids, and if any of us invited anybody over, there was always more than 10 of us, so usually around 20 people for Sabbaths hung out at my parents' house. And I loved it. But sometimes it takes a little bit of practice for us to know that, yes, this is something that God is using as a spiritual gift. Now, one question that is very common is, what is the difference between a talent and a spiritual gift. Talents can be spiritual gifts, but not all spiritual gifts are talents. And let me just give you some examples. So for example, art, if you're artistic, like Pastor Clay and his wife Lindsay, they're incredibly creative. That is a talent that's within them. But God has also been using it as a spiritual gift to reach people in this church and outside. The same thing with singing, for example. It may be a natural talent, but God can use it as a spiritual gift to reach people for God. Our youth who have created a band, Caruso Worship Collective, they have an album that's out and has been streaming all over the world. There are many people who are sending us notes saying, thank you so much the music has changed my life. That's a way that God uses natural talents as spiritual gifts. Or speaking another language. 
Yes, there are stories when it's just specifically a spiritual gift where someone is speaking and they're being heard in different languages, but it can also be a natural ability or talent that God then uses for ministry. I have only met one person in my whole life who can, who learned how to speak Czech as an adult and spoke it perfectly because the Czech language is a difficult language because it has one sound that no other language in the world has. And that's, that's, that's a, it's an R with an accent on top of it and it's pronounced R. But that person learned it. So there are people who have these incredible gifts and different things that then God can use as a way to really bring the gospel to people. Or interpretation. I can speak other, another language, but I'm not a good translator. I'm horrible at it. That's not a gift. Whereas some others, that's a gift they have. But then, like I said, there are spiritual gifts that are only spiritual gifts. Like the gift of prophecy. That is not something we can choose or say that I have a natural talent for. Or the gift of healing. If someone prays over someone, puts their hand on them, that's not a natural talent. That is a gift. Well, I want us to look at more of these gifts and, and study them a little bit more because we're doing an introduction to this topic today. So I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4 which is where a list of gifts is, but it's a short list. And that's why we're going to go to a couple other passages so that you can see them. Ephesians chapter 4 first starts out by saying, I therefore, this is Paul saying, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you or I beg of you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness or humility, gentleness, and bearing with one another in love. He's saying you need to do it with patience with each other. He starts this chapter with the word therefore. And you've heard me say this before. The word therefore always changes the trajectory of what they are teaching. The first three chapters of Ephesians, he has been saying Jesus has died for you. He believes that you are valuable. And that's why he gave his life for you. And now because of what he has done, therefore live like this. And part of this living like this, it's not so that we are saved, but because we understand that he is so amazing and he has done all of this in my life. And that's why I want to live like this. And part of it is spiritual gifts. Jump with me to verse 11. And he himself, God, is the one who decides who's going to get what gift gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. He starts with apostles. This is a list of those who he sees around him all the time during this time. And the time of the New Testament, of after Jesus leaves, they still have all of this. They have apostles. There were 12 of them originally. Went down to 11. But there were others who were designated as apostles in Scripture because Apostle really means someone who is sent out with a message. And isn't that all of us? We are all sent out with a message because Jesus said, go and make disciples. So yes, the 11 are those, are the apostles. So there's a special kind of apostle, which is the 11. And then also a couple more, Paul and James, who was a brother of Jesus, because they both got, the, got to see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. But then there, is, there are also those who are called apostles like Titus and Epaphroditus whose task was to be missionaries and to be church planters, to start up new churches. Well, the next, the next category is prophets. Prophecy was happening during that time. It's, it's said in the New Testament that there were prophets in Jerusalem, there were prophets in Crete, there were prophets in Antioch. And doesn't she just say one prophet? It says prophets, plural. It names one of them, Agabus. He came and he said, there will be a famine in this region, so prepare for it. He also came and said, Paul, if you go to Rome, you're going to be in prison, put in chains. And the people said, oh, Paul, you can't go. 
But he went anyways because he knew what his mission was. And then there are four ladies who were prophets. The four daughters of Philip said they were prophetesses during this time. It shouldn't surprise us that there were lots of prophets during this time because it ends a prophetic time period. Prophets always appear at a critical time in history for God's people or at the beginning and at the end of a prophetic period. This, when Jesus appears, this time right there, is the end of the 70-week prophecy in Daniel. That's why there are prophets around. The same thing with the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel. The beginning of it was Ezra and Nehemiah, and the end of it, you know who came? Ellen White. That's why I believe that Ellen White is a prophet, not just because of the signs, but because there is a pattern in Scripture about when prophets appear. Next category is evangelists. We, have, we know that there was one especially, and that's Philip during this time. And fi about Philip, there is one word that's used a lot. And those who, of the youth who are part of the collective worship collective band, they know this word. They were saying it upstairs. It's the word caruso. The word caruso means to proclaim, to make known, to preach. And that was the task of Philip. And then the last one in this category is pastors and teachers. What I find incredible about this is that he is using one definite article for both. Paul is not separating the two. He's not saying pastors and then teachers. He's saying pastor teachers. He's putting them together. Because as a pastor, you are overseer of a group of people. You're the shepherd of a group of people. And you're also responsible for the teachings of that group of people. And Paul said this to the leaders of the Ephesus church, which is what this letter is to, but he also says it in Acts as he's speaking to them, which today we would say these are board members and elders and ministry leaders. This is what he tells them. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I love this line. He says, you are shepherds and you need to know that you're shepherds over something precious. These people have been bought by my blood. So you need to value them just like I value them. And you need to care about what is being taught to them. He says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. It is the responsibility of pastor teachers to care about what is being taught to their people and to make sure they're teaching the truth. There are really only four categories of people that Paul mentions right here. And that's why I want to take you to the other passage, the other two passages that list spiritual gifts so that you can see all the other ones that are listed in the Bible. The first one is in Romans chapter 12. They're both in chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts, in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. He adds to what was already said, ministry or service, I believe that's the gift of helping, just seeing that something needs to be done. My mom has that gift. Michael has that gift. He always sees whatever needs to be done. I don't. I have to be told that this is what needs to be done. I do. It's not my gift. Exhortation, persuasion and encouragement, giving, leadership, doing acts of mercy or doing good acts. And then if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the list continues. There are some that are repeated again and some that are brand new. 
1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another differing kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. He says, pay attention to this, it's the Holy Spirit who is giving us these gifts. And then if you flip to the end of that chapter, verse 28, he adds some more and repeats. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. He added to what was already said, wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing and miracles, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues, and administration. Because none of those lists are the same, we know that these are just examples of spiritual gifts. There are some spiritual gifts that are obvious, like we've already mentioned, and there are some not so obvious ones, like the gift of encouragement. Probably people don't realize that it is a spiritual gift, but we need that gift. I know who has the, the gift of encouragement for me in my life, and that's my parents. And whenever I need to be encouraged, I go to them. We need people who have these different gifts. And so, and we ourselves need to use them. Or making friends easily. That may be a gift that we don't often think about is a spiritual gift. But it is. That's how people can hear about God, about Jesus, because we make friends with them. Or make people feel comfortable. Or the gift of prayer. That's not mentioned here. But that's a huge gift that we all should be using, but there are some who know that that is a ministry God has given them. Okay, so we have established that spiritual gifts are a thing, they're important. But the question is then, what is the purpose of these gifts? What is the point of them? I've mentioned it a little bit, but let's see what Paul says. So go back to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll continue with verse 12. He says, These gifts have been given for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man. And my Bible says perfect man, but really, we don't become perfect. The translation, the, good tra the right translation here is mature disciples to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Don't you just love that term, the fullness of Christ, that we become full of Christ? Clearly, spiritual gifts are not given so that we become great at something and others will admire us. That is not the point. And yet, that can be a temptation. We may want a certain gift because then we'll be admired. I did as a kid, I would always see people who would sing just beautifully and were admired and I thought, oh, I want to sing like that. But spiritual gifts have a much deeper purpose, much deeper reason. Number one, he says, they're given so that we are equipped for ministry. And then number two, which I really like in the NIV better than in my Bible version because it says it's for edifying the body of Christ. The NIV says it's for building up the body of Christ. So that we become mature disciples, ourselves, who are full of Christ. I love how that works. We are to use spiritual gifts so that we are more and more like Jesus. More and more filled with Jesus. John Maxwell, who is a leadership guru, who is a Christian and has built everything on, on scripture. In his leadership lessons, I believe that there's one that is his motto because you will hear him talk about it all the time. He always says that every single morning he wakes up and he asks the question, how can I add value to someone else's life today? He is intentional about adding value. 
Well, I think that he got something right. And that is adding value to a someone's, someone else's life means making someone else's life better. And isn't that what the spiritual gifts are for? That's what I would say in modern terms what Paul is saying. He is saying Christ values you so now go out and value others. And the best way that you can value others is by not just adding value, any value, but by adding Jesus, by adding me. Add me to their lives. There is nothing greater that we can give than Jesus. You heard a testimony today of, from Todd about how he prays with people at the hospital. That's a way that we add value to someone else. He continues in this passage and he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. And then he ends this passage by saying, when we do this, the growth that results in a growth of the body of Christ, especially in love. Christ values us, and so we are to now add value to others. There's a story that John Maxwell tells about teaching his grandchildren how to, how to add value. And he asked his seven-year-old grandson, how are you going to add value to somebody else tomorrow? And the grandson said, Papa, that's what they call him, I am going to open doors for people tomorrow. And he said, but Papa, not just going to open doors for people, I am also going to smile at them when they walk through the doors. That evening, they have a phone call about what happened, and the grandson says proudly to him, Papa, I opened 47 doors today. I just love that adding value is not just something that you can do when you're an adult. At any age, you can add value. At any age, we can add Jesus to someone else's life. But Jesus does say, when you add me to somebody else's life, they're not always going to be happy. They're not always going to want it. Just as the world hated me, they will hate you sometimes. Just like the three Hebrew boys stood up and said, no, we're not going to bow down against this. There are times we have to stand up. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't see that as kindness. He didn't see it as value added to him. But it was them adding Jesus to everyone around them. We are to add Jesus through the spiritual gifts that God has given us. And so my hope for each one of us is that for the rest of this series, and maybe beyond, that this catches on, that you pray one prayer every morning as you wake up. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on me so that I may add Jesus to someone else today. I would hope that you put it on something so that the first thing as you wake up, you see it. Jesus wants us to be adding him to the people around us all the time. And we have to be intentional about it. Otherwise it won't happen. And the, to do it the right way, we need the Holy Spirit to do it through us. We won't know how to add value without the Holy Spirit. He is the one who gives the gifts. So I encourage you to pray that prayer. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on me so that I may add Jesus to someone today. I'm going to pray it and I hope that you join me. Because I want to add Jesus wherever I go. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you help us to add you wherever we go. 
pour out your Holy Spirit on us so that we can make a difference in someone else's life, that we can add value by adding you. There's nothing more important than you. And if we believe it, if we know it, if we know how amazing you are, then we will want it for others. So give us that conviction. Give us more of your Holy Spirit so that whatever we do, we keep remembering to add you as we go. I put us all into your hands this morning. Thank you for being with us. I pray this new name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for worship. We do have Sabbath school classes or small groups that are going on around the building. Please join one. Get to know somebody else. And I will see you next Sabbath. We love you.